Welcome to the Basic Income Show. I'm Scott Santens, and my co-hosts are Josh Wirth and Conrad Shaw. And uh, here is our theme to start things off. This intro music is AI generated. Love it or hate it, no one was compensated. A little more disco this time, a little more, a little pop, <laughs> top 40 kind of thing. Yeah, that, that would be I, fun to uh, just do some different AI versions each time, really lean into the fact that uh, it's just using AI and just spit something, some new version out each week. Our last episode was, a lot of it was about a uh, response to Hurricane Helene and FEMA and stuff. And here we are now with uh, Milton bearing down on Florida. And I think it'd be good just to, again, just talk about this for a little bit about how effective it would be both for universal space game in general to already exist to help people, but also just commingle again as a, as a tool that could exist right now to help people too, and how that would work. Yeah. We, we, uh, we talked about that a lot last time. Um, I was, I was, uh, less composed than I like to be in general. Um, just because I'm really just sort of saddened and angered by the fact that we can't be helping that the help that comes is too little, too late, too frustrating for people. But um, with uh, Milton, uh, like one of the things we could have been doing, we've had, what, four or five days of heads up on this. We've known this was coming and the approximate area of where it was going, and we've known the affected zip codes and counties that were given evacuation orders we could already be sending money to the people ahead of the hurricane so they could afford to evacuate. That's a big problem with hurricanes is people like I can't afford gas, you know, or I can't afford a hotel or whatever. We could be channeling money to the people to get out of harm's way. We could be actively saving lives right now. Yeah. Uh, A big, a big uh, philanthropic boost of any kind, whether it's from a whole bunch of people or for, from one generous person or a group, uh, the money could be very quickly transferred into the accounts of the people that are evacuating right now and help them pay for gas, help them pay for a hotel room, whatever it needs. But we'll get there. We're working on it. It's coming. <laughs> but it, it, the thing that makes me really angry is, uh, you know, I'm constantly fundraising and um, it, every time something happens, like some big disaster, all the people who are potentially going to help us with the system change work and building this stuff uh, disappear and say, oh, no, we need to focus on the presidential election first, or we need to focus on the fallout of the current hurricane first. And we need to put that like $300,000 towards helping people like somehow with the floods, where the whole point of commingle is to amplify how much money can be moved how quickly if we'd had this up now that three hundred thousand dollar investment could look like three hundred million dollars being moved to the people in the most impactful way so putting that off is never a good idea yeah at the the macro scale too we're we're looking at that same kind of phenomenon i think like i I've, i've read that uh the estimate for the damage to uh, from Helene is going to cost uh, like two hundred billion dollars in total over that. And again, like Milton hasn't happened yet, but that could be uh, around that scale too, or greater. And like as we spend more and more for like, recovering from disasters, like at the federal level, I can see people being like, "Let's we got to tighten our belts. We can't afford to do basic income. You know, we gotta we gotta spend." few hundred billion here and a few hundred billion there for these disasters. And then we won't ever like come out ahead of it. We won't ever like really help people recover from it. Uh, You know, we'll lack that resilience just because we'll always be constantly, you know, treating things after the fact. It's the same logic with basic income itself where, you know, people are like, oh, well, that's just too expensive to spend a trillion dollars a year. And then, you know, as we say over and over, we're spending well over 
a couple trillion dollars a year in poverty and a couple trillion dollars a year, in, you know, and everything else, ill health, crime and all that stuff. So well, with, we have to health. change our mindset uh, right. instead of just constantly worrying about, you know, putting out fires. Let's like, let's start preventing fires. Yeah. With the health example, it's like, uh, you know, you're trying to raise money and, and develop a cure and they say, we don't have a million dollars for that. We need to be spending a hundred million dollars on hospitalizing people indefinitely. It's just, it's just absurd and myopic to, to limit yourself that way. Yeah. And it, it's really vaccine logic. You know, it's like, let's, uh, let's spend $50, you know, for someone to get a shot instead of decades from that point, not having done that, you know, having to spend a few hundred thousand dollars or millions or whatever for cancer treatment or, you know, whatever it is that we could have prevented. And crime too. It's like, what, yeah. what are the costs uh, for keeping someone you know, incarcerated, it depends where you are, but the national average is like many tens of thousands of dollars. And if you're in like New York City, I think it's like a hundred thousand. Uh, and people balk at the idea of, you know, make giving people who are on the edge you know, twelve thousand dollars a year or whatever, but that's a much smaller number than you know, sixty thousand, seventy thousand dollars a year. But yeah. Margaret in the chat is saying applies to the cri climate crisis as well. Exactly. Preventative. Yeah. 100%. Preventative medicine is by far cheaper in, in every sort of uh, circle. Yeah. And, and I consistently say like every time I'm talking about universal basic income in response to the climate crisis and how important it is for recovering resilience, like we can pair it with a carbon tax and that's a do accomplish two things at the same time. Let's, let's actually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions at the same time as reducing poverty. And, you know, like, why aren't we doing that? We can do that right now. It just drives me crazy that these things are happening and it's just still not politically feasible here in the U S with, you know, Republicans being against this. And I'm, I saw recently too, that Canada might actually even get rid of their carbon tax and, and rebate program. They essentially already have a small UBI through that um, with these cashback payments paired with a carbon tax. And the conservatives up in Canada are just lying about this, saying that, you know, yeah, people are getting back whatever the payment is, say $300 is the payment. And it's like, oh, no, like the costs are up so much more than that. Um, you know, basically using like the inflation from the pandemic and saying that, oh, it's like the carbon tax has driven inflation up so much. And so even though you're getting cash back, it's not as much, even though that's a lie that they are actually getting more. And it's just, you know, the inflation that happened and the reason costs are higher from years ago is just because of the pandemic and the impacts from that. So it'd be really frustrating for Canada to actually get rid of that. That's like super useful and really accomplishing um, what it's meant to accomplish. Going beyond this to the first thing, I think it'd be fun to cover the fact that Conrad was recently in a um, in a video with um, John Stossel. He was interviewed as as part of that video, and I think it'd be fun for us to to watch it together, and then we can uh, just provide some commentary through it. Does that, does that sound good? Yeah, I'm curious to see what you guys thought. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, here it goes. Want some free money? Giving money to everyone is an idea that cities and counties have been trying out. They call it a basic income. Dozens of Democratic-led cities piloting what they're called UBI income programs. Some billionaires like the idea. We should explore ideas like universal basic income. We will have to have some kind of universal basic income. It would save my community, says comedian Dave Chappelle. It would save all sense You would effectively get rid of extreme poverty immediately. Hey, Conrad I know that Shaw guy. calls himself the UBI guy. You talk about magical effects from a basic income starting businesses, investing in improvements in their home or their sustainable gardens. Sustainable gardens are nice. And these protesters are right to say people are the economy, but we still have to. Pro Wait, so before we go on from there, I just want to give you some space to uh, to expound on. Uh, clearly, he liked that example uh, of putting in the garden stuff as being like, OK, yeah. yeah, isn't that like nice to you can have time with your garden? Like kinda, what's some kinda... uh, other stuff that you said? 
it kind of went into his whole well like the, the whole like smirky attitude thing and oh gardens are nice and then it's like first of all a sustainable garden is like vegetable garden and you feed your family or like take it to the you know the farmer's market or whatever uh and so they they picked a picture of like someone planting some flowers so they could more easily mock it i think but that's a real thing we saw i mean that's a valuable thing to do with your time and your money is to grow your food at home I, yeah i think you I, i'm surprised that i mean john's got a very conservative uh, audience if you watch the video online and go in the com comments maybe we can go in the comments later um it's pretty stark but that's a <laughs> that's a highly held value for a lot of people in you know conservative country is like you know you know being able to feed yourself and your family to a great degree you know live off the land and so it's kind of funny to see it mocked that way the other thing to keep in <laughs> mind in general is that um um I sat with, with John for about an hour and it was a lovely conversation and you'll see maybe like 20 seconds uh, of what I have to say. So um, keep that in mind that he's very specifically choosing certain things uh, and we can talk about it more. When but, we get so there. how did this, before you get into it, how did all this even come about? Like uh, did somebody just reached out on Twitter is like, hey, John Stossel wants to talk to you. What, what happened? Uh, yeah, it, probably an email reached out to me and Scott, um, his, his team okay. reached out to us cause he saw us on Andrew Yang's podcast. Mm, yeah. Uh, okay. And how did you guys decide who was going to be the, the sucker that got to go and talk to him? I'm generally more <laughs> the, of a sucker than Scott. Yeah. I think. <laughs> the, the timing no. actually didn't work out for me. Uh, they wanted to film when I was in, uh, Chicago mm. and, um, so that wouldn't have worked out. And then they delayed it so that it actually would have worked. But then Conrad was already set up. And I thought Conrad would do a great job. So um, I was happy to, you know, see him do it. Were you disappointed when you saw the final thing, Scott? <laughs> I let you down? <laughs> I thought you did great. And it turned out the way that I expected it to. I knew there was going to be this negative tilt. And then I don't want to get into really more of what I thought of it, both like before going into it and after it. Right. Until let's, we cover let's more. Let's watch some more. Yeah. Let's continue. Okay. Produce things too. If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. And making stuff often requires difficult work. I would have stayed in bed all day if I didn't have to make money. I don't believe you. I think you might say that, but I don't believe you. After one day, you'd say, this sucks. Nobody actually wants that. Needing to work pushed me to overcome my fears, my stuttering. And I'm a better person because of it. I think people find their passions not simply because they need to make money. We could argue about this forever. Makes me wish someone had... Okay, so I just want to stop there, too, because he's going to go on to an experiment and, and talk about that. But Stossel is very libertarian-leaning, and here he is making the argument that if he didn't need to work, then he wouldn't have gone on to you know, do all these great things uh, throughout his life. He, you know, would have just stayed in bed or whatever. The incentive to work is, is not only to eat and sleep indoors, and it's not only to like do something that uh, you may enjoy, but then from the libertarian perspective, you're doing it because you want money to spend on like fun stuff. Most people out there are earning more than $12,000 per year. Why are they earning more than $12,000 per year? According to this kind of logic, as soon as you earn $12,000 a year, then you can just stop working um, more than necessary. Like just do eight hours, 10 hours a week or whatever, get your twelve, get your $1,000 a month uh, from that, and then just do leisure the rest of the time. And who cares if you can't afford like anything else? Uh, you know, you're not going to be able to go on vacation. You're not going to buy like a PS5 to play your video games on. You're not going to be able to go to concerts or go out to restaurants or bars or whatever it is that you would want to do because you can't afford it. So everyone wants to raise their incomes more than $12,000 per year. That's not enough. So there is still an incentive to work for the same reason that everyone even earning $60,000 wants to earn 80000 or 100000 or 120000 Like it's never enough. You always want to earn more because you always want to spend more. And that's a very libertarian argument. Yeah. And uh, like I've had a lot of people in the comments here and on Twitter 
basically making the same case that, you know, you don't know people. You know, my wife is on is on disability and she hasn't worked a day in, in the last two years. It's like because she's on <laughs> disability. disability. Nice. She's forced not to work and or I would never have worked. I've really taken to calling people's bluff on this uh, when they say I would never do a damn thing. And to the extent that either one, you you're oversimplifying it, you're not really thinking it through. Nobody wants to sit around and stare at the wall or play video games for, you know, 40 years because it's just because it's possible. There was one guy today. It really stuck out to me. He's like, I would have just played video games all through my uh, college days or whatever. And I would just done that for years and never done anything else. Um, and then now I would just have like my wife and kids. I would just work just enough to make sure my wife and kids are financially OK. And then I would just go like hunt and fish and stuff like that. And my response to him was a little more along the cold hearted uh, conservative line where it was like, well, if you're just going to play video games all, all day for 15 years, then you'll be a loser. And uh, <laughs> I'll go out and get that job and I'll be glad for less competition from people who don't really want to be there. Right. And then 15 years after that, uh, what makes you think that wife and kids are going to materialize if you're a loser who sits at home playing video games all day? Right. And, uh, you know, and he's like, well, the job really is the thing that spurred me on to to find purpose and meaning and stuff like that. And well, I it. Yeah, maybe today that's what we use is the fear of scarcity, the fear of 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 poverty. But in this world that we're imagining, if you look around you and other people are like having kids and starting fun things and get, having cars and going on vacations and you're sitting around playing video games, uh, I think that's kind of an incentive. You know, it doesn't have to right. be the incentive is pain, the, the like avoidance right. of pain. It, I or, mean, or I don't like, know that we should even be using the video game example anymore because there's plenty of people that sit around playing video games and make some nice money. Highly and, yeah, you can, be, you can be a multi-millionaire playing YouTube video games. channels going. People are, yeah. I mean, Mr. Beast was yeah. a gamer to start off with. So right. like, but I, I, sitting I around really, making video games is not but, the worst thing anymore. I, 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 I do I, like that hmm. argument, like the, the social incentive. Um, you know, it's, it's very true. Like for all the guys out there, you know, if you're in your you know, late teens, early 20s or something, and you're thinking... Um, that you would like a girlfriend, uh, then I'm telling you, they're not going to be impressed if you don't do anything, you know, and that's true regardless of if you have a basic income or not. Like it's impressive yeah. when <laughs> you, you have a job of some kind, you're good at something because you've, you're doing something, um, with like to build up skills. Uh, it's, it's, it's not impressive to not do anything. And that is, that social pressure to like do stuff is, is very strong beyond just a financial incentive. Yeah. That's, it's really fun to actually kind of throw back there. Like, well, they made their choices and throw it in their faces sort of thing. Like it's their fault for being poor. It's like, uh, I kind of feel the same way in a, in a paradigm where you make it possible for everyone who is a hardworking, talented person, like, or like really just putting in the effort to be safe and secure that's when I start feeling that way. They feel that way now where it's like, screw them. They made the wrong choices and they're poor and they were lazy or whatever. It's like, well, no, why don't we just make a world where everyone where poor means like your life is just really mediocre. And that's, that's the people who are poor and then say, well, if they just want to, they screw them. They decided to sit around and play video games all day. They can, they, you know, they chose that life. Like it's the same line of logic. But now they're saying, well, I would have chosen that life and I would have been worthless and pathetic. And uh, it's like, then then you shouldn't have sympathy for yourself in that situation. If you don't have sympathy for people who bust their asses really hard and find themselves in that situation today. And then they're like, oh, well, who's going to clean our toilets? It's like you're, you, the entire line of logic falls apart, you know, and it becomes evident that it's projection of their own fears of their own internal laziness and lack of drive and things like that. Before we go on to just, uh, again, like another part of this libertarian argument, the other part of this too is, is I'm, I'm sure John Stossel believes in free markets and a free market is basically a free market transaction is defined as when both sides of that transaction have the ability to walk away. 
So if, if one side does not have the ability to do that, then that's a coercive transaction. And that's a problem from the libertarian perspective. Like everyone should have the power to say no to any particular transaction. And that's what basic income does is it makes a free market for labor. Currently, that doesn't exist. You know, currently you walk into a transaction in the labor market with an employer and they're offering you potentially something very low because low is better than nothing. And then so you accept it and then you still live in poverty. And then as a result, you get, you know, assistance from the government that's subsidizing the employer. The whole thing is messed up because of the fact that the person doesn't have the power to walk away. So if you're a libertarian and you believe in free markets, then you should believe in a free market for labor which requires a basic income in order for that to be an actual real thing. Yeah. And Margaret in the chat said people in retirement get bored all the time. Yeah, that's a big deal. When you retire, either you find something that that to, to make that the purpose of your life and the reason you're around, or you generally die early. A lot of people come out of retirement for that reason or find other ha hobbies and pursuits, just like if you lose your spouse or your partner and they're your everything. If you don't find something else to put your life into, you see these older couples like very quickly one follows the other because it's like, what do I have left? Nobody wants to just sit around and consume consumer goods. You know, people who want to have have there be a reason that they exist. And it's funny, too, to bring up retirement because John Stossel is actually receiving Social Security payments. So he's technically able to retire at any moment. Like he doesn't have to keep doing this. He's got that basic income floor. I don't know what the size is. It's probably pretty close to the maximum for social security. So he's probably getting uh, somewhere over like 3000, somewhere between 3000, $4,000 per month, I think from social security. I think that's the, the current maximum. Um, so he does not need to work. That's much higher than a basic income floor is, but there he is interviewing you and saying that if he had it, then he wouldn't be interviewing you, which clearly he is, and he does. <laughs> He's probably also pretty rich anyway from being you know, a known personality for a very long time. Um, oh, yeah. He's got plenty of savings. He's got a high income through this. But regardless of that, he has that passive income floor through Social Security. And I think that's like just a key argument I did for bring that up in the, him. I did bring that up in the comments with someone who who said, my blood was boiling as soon as he called John a liar. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm just calling out hype, something I felt was hype, hyperbolic and you're trying to keep him honest. Um, and, uh, and are you aware that he gets Social Security, which is more than a basic income? Why is he making these videos? And right. it doesn't seem like he's lying in bed all day. And they said, well, he meant <laughs> when he was younger. Uh, that, that's why. And it's like, whatever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go on. Done a serious test of UBI, a study that gave people thousands of dollars and then followed them for maybe three years. Then we'd see if UBI really has those magical effects. Actually, it turns out that Sam Altman, known for creating ChatGPT, backed such a study. Altman's study gave a thousand low-income people one thousand dollars per month over a three-year period. It was free money, no strings attached. If you could just give people money they would make good decisions some did altman's study found people mostly spent the extra money on basics such as food rent and transportation the largest increase in their spending was to help family and friends with their bills that's nice but remarkably after three years of getting a thousand dollars a month ubi recipients were a little deeper in debt and had a lower net worth people that okay this is interesting. We haven't talked about this. So for those who uh, want to go into the study more, uh, we actually covered this in our, I think, episode one of the Basic Income Show. So we kind of went deeply into it there. Um, but in that show, we didn't talk about the impacts on like debt and net worth. Uh, so I just want to provide like this is additional context. So it, it's like when you look at something like this, you look at that and you read that on the screen and like, oh, well, they increased their debt and their household net worth went down. So clearly that's bad. And like, I can totally see that. But then if you expand the context, so imagine uh, you're someone who gets a basic income. And as a result of that, 
you put away, uh, you save like five thousand um, dollars over that three year study. So your savings increase by five thousand dollars. And then let's say you get a um, let's say you, you take out a loan for a car uh, because you didn't have one. And um, let's say you even needed a car for work. So you you take out a loan uh, for like a cheap kind of used car. Um, let's say it's ten thousand dollars for this car. So uh, you have this you have this debt now of ten thousand dollars, and that's compared to your five thousand dollars in savings. So according to that, your net worth has gone down five thousand um, dollars. But also now you have a car. And you built up savings, and let's say you even have uh, a job when you didn't have one, or let's say you have a better job because you're able to gr- go further for that job. So clearly, that person is doing better off. But if all you do is look at the debt and the net worth, you can look at that as you being worse off when clearly you aren't. So yeah, the context is really important. Yeah, having some debt like just also means that you're willing to take it on, like. You can now see that, oh, I can take on the risk of this debt, like that maybe right. I need this to start my business or whatever it is I'm trying to do. Like it, debt isn't always a bad thing. Like you take it on to pursue bigger and better things usually, like the way that it's supposed to work. Yeah. Yeah. The ability to take on debt or or in other words, to have credit is a very valuable asset in society that a lot of people are barred from. And this these examples aren't things that Scott is just, you know, pulling out of his ass to like make a case, like an edge case. You know, we had a basic income pilot with not that many people and they got themselves out of like we had people get themselves out of payday loan debt and then buy a new car to get to work. We had people who have never had never had a house before were always renting in a, in a crappy situation. It took them six months to like save up enough money to put a down payment on a house and be homeowners for the very first time in their lives. And their net worth very well may have gone down because of that. But now they're homeowners, their expenses are lower, and they're building up wealth over time because of this opportunity. Uh, myself, personally, the, the, I've talked about this a little bit before, but having the ability to have credit cards was the only way we, we started these projects from the beginning. You know, I, Dea, my, my wife, and I were leaning on the fact that she was, had credibility as a, as a documentarian, but we didn't have any funders early on. And it took years. And we just started going out on the road and and documenting stories and putting together the concept and the idea. And to do that, we took out ten thousand dollar balance transfers on our credit cards. And because we were able to take that risk and put our own seed money in, um, we built something worth millions of dollars. Yeah, and I'll I'll add too that um, like the example I gave was to was to explain even what the study itself says. So. Um, you know, I'm not even coming up with an edge case, just like as as like an illustration of of how this is wrong. I'm saying that the study itself showed this, and I'm illustrating the example of a person to help explain that. Um, like as a, a, a statistic from the study, uh, if I recall, was um, household savings increased by forty percent. So, if you look at that that's a good thing. Like we, we want people to be able to build up savings and, you know, they're, they're more prepared for an emergency and that has increased their household wealth technically. Um, but then a, a lot, another thing that they did is, um, is the uh, treatment group increased their credit scores compared to the control group. So that's actually people doing that on purpose. Like, it's not about, it's not like you're being irresponsible and you're taking on like debt by like buying crap. Uh, it's like people actually made the specific decision to take out a credit card because they could, uh, like prior to that, maybe they could only use debit cards. And so they're able to take out a credit card and they want to do that to build up credit because a credit score, you need that for so many things. Um, you know, like you need a good credit score for an apartment, you know, like in order to sign a lease, you have to have a good credit score. So people are making these decisions on purpose because they're these are smart financial decisions. And then, you know, the, if you compare your, your credit that you've taken out and you can be paying it off on like a monthly basis, uh, but you're, you're, it, you can look at that as being, oh, that's increased your debt. And you can compare that to your increased savings. And yeah, you could have decreased net wealth because of the combination of those factors. Um, but 
any honest person reading this study will look at that. And after reading the numbers, the, all of it, and then also the anecdotes, um, you know, the the interviews with the people to actually kind of illustrate the numbers, then you have a better understanding of this. And if you just cherry pick these like couple passages like this and then put it out there, people get the wrong impression and they're not going to read the study. They're just going to think that they understand the study based on these like quote polls. Yeah, this was definitely the, the uh, section th of the interview where it was clear to me, and even in the prep, that they wanted this Sam Altman pilot and like these these like these sort of gotcha headlines to be the 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 sort of the thrust of this video. And this is the part where I was like, maybe Scott should have been the one they interviewed because <laughs> he does the deep dives on these things. I'm too busy like working on my other stuff. <laughs> um, but I don't think they like. They, they would have taken four seconds of whatever you just said in yeah, five sure. minutes and done the same thing to you. Yeah, they're always, always wanting to do that. And it's always funny, too, when it, we've talked about this before, where uh, if you're looking to cherry pick a negative study, then you're going to look through the stuff and you're going to look at this study and go, oh, like Sam Altman's pilot agrees most with what I think would happen based on these factors that I can cherry pick from the study. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. And then like completely ignoring every other pilot. Like we're at over 150 pilots in the U.S. Uh, of all kinds of, of sizes and, and uh, designs and stuff. And each thing can kind of teach us something new and different. And, you know, I would say some are better than others because some, you know, don't have a control group. And but lots do. And it's important to look at like all of these. Like I want to look at a pile of studies and determine from like a hundred studies, what seems to be um, the actual human behavior uh, from basic income based on these kind of different factors and understandings. And if you just look at one study, you're not going to get the full picture. You're not going to understand basic income very well. And, but you're going to think that you do. Um, so that's what frustrates me about stuff like this is that they're just pulling one study and that's all they're talking about is if these other things don't exist. Well, it's just sort of the objective too, is not to, uh, like have, you know, sincere discussion or debate. You can, uh, it was one thing that was dawning on me as I read through all the comments. I mean, I know the comments in the comment section, if a hundred thousand people see it and 1000 people comment, those are the people who are like the most bonkers in general and are just going to say hardcore things. And the other 99,000, like it, that's who I'm trying to talk to and like get them to open their minds a little bit. But based on the way they presented this and based on the comments from a lot of people that watched this, this digestible five minute piece, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't get any sort of understanding of what UBI is. There was nothing that like everyone thinks in these comments that welfare and UBI are the same thing. They, they think right. it's exactly the same which to me is sort of a disservice done by the journalists and sort of points to the fact that journalism is not about educating your audience. It's about uh, giving them a, an avenue to vent strongly felt uh, opinions or to be outraged because um, that's where the clicks come from. That's where John gets his money and the, and the shares and the clicks is like a nice digestible thing with like a you know, sort of an obnoxious title and like him waving money around at the beginning and, and inviting people to say this, you know, this asshole up here has never taken a single economics course or something like that. Um, it's not about really educating people uh, and doing journalism. Yeah, you should not walk away from a piece like this so misinformed. Like if, if you're trying to teach someone something, then hopefully they come away, yeah, with something new, some new understanding um, but yeah, today's media, like so much of it involves audience capture where they're really, instead of like trying to inform the audience about things, they're just like trying to chase the, uh, personal biases and opinions of the audience to reinforce those opinions, because that's what gets so many views and clicks and advertising revenue and everything else. Um, so I'm not going to say that that Stossel over the years has like, altered his views based on, you know, the feedback from his, his, his viewers, because he has been around for a while and he's always been, you know, like a libertarian journalist. But I would say in general, that's like a problem with, with YouTube and, and 
you know, non-legacy alternative media. It's a good thing to get these alternative viewpoints that can that can be better than legacy media viewpoints, uh, especially if you can go into it deeper. Like if you can spend two hours on something versus five minutes, clearly that's something that can actually uh, better inform people. But one of the problems with the algorithm is that people who are creating content just start creating content for their own viewers. And then you're you're no longer trying to inform them. You're just trying to, to make them happy, um, make them you know, click and watch and everything. And that's an issue, yeah. you know, with our current yeah. system. And that's the only way to get, to stay relevant, whether if it's, if your main purpose is to, you know, be a, a journalist or make money or whatever, people all get pushed in that direction because the only way to get any attention and traction is like in this market of that, this kind of media is to do that kind of stuff. I remember it was like, we've been talking for an hour and it was sort of a lovely conversation. I got a lot of good points in and we were, he just kind of, and maybe it's cause he's 77 years old and sort of tired, but he just kind of got visibly exhausted at one point. Like we, I had been, you know, fielding all of his questions or statements or whatever. And he kept making me like, make it pithier. Like you can't say something for more than four seconds that I can use. It was basically the, the message I kept getting. And at some point, he just kind of looked at me in the eyes and said, "This is kind of a boring subject, isn't it?" <laughs> and he's All like, right, "Let's and, let's let's keep going before we go into more of what like Stossel thought." That received these UBI payments started working less. Recipients' partners worked less too. I'm not surprised if you give people free money. Of course, they'll work less. Okay, so we already covered this in episode one, but just a quick summary for listeners right now. Um, the average was that people work less, um, which was about 2% less per year, which is equivalent to about a 15 minute break uh, each work day. So like very slight uh, compared to the control group, but also there was no impact among uh childless adults and adults over age 30. So the impact really was only among those age 21 to 30 and mostly single parents. So like their average between the two of them would say more like four or 5%, which together with the zero or near 0% 0 of the others, then that actually, you know, pulled it to 2%. So it's important to understand that because if you look at you know those specific groups, I don't think society is going to get upset that you know young adults are choosing college and um, you know choosing let's say starting up their own business or something else, um, and single parents are taking care of their kids uh, instead of paying for childcare and going to a job. Like those are actually good things, and. Um, I think it's. A, I think his listeners would even think differently about that if he were to go into that. But again, if you're just looking to uh, cherry pick something and make it seem like it failed, then you'll just say that people work less and like what a terrible impact that was. But even after that big study, UBI proponents are still believers. People would still work if they got the basic income and start businesses and try new things. Absolutely. But very few did. And even they didn't act on it until year three. When so the, uh, part of the context of this is, again, the average showed that across the entire um, group of people, this was 1,000 recipients of basic income compared to 2,000 people in the control group. Um, there wasn't that much of a difference in increasing in, in starting a business. But then if you zoom in, on women and black participants, then those were actually pretty significant. Um, I believe uh, they were around, uh, I think it was women was like 15% and um, black participants was like, um, maybe like 20 to 30%, something around that. Uh, so these were like large impacts for those group and those groups and that's what pulled that up. And um, as we discussed in like episode one, I think when we talked about this, that we see those impacts in those groups because those groups are the ones that 
find it harder to actually access capital to start a business. And, and that's where you see this kind of impact in that context is important to understand. Like I would say, yes, you did see success in starting a business because you're looking at the groups that are unable to start a business without basic income. And they, to a large degree, were able to start a business because of basic income. Well, it also looks like if you look at this chart, which he flashed up very quickly, um, as time went on, the the uh, treatment group started ramping up and more and more their their business starting relative to the control group. Like they started right. getting more and more secure. So what does this look like in four years and five years? But to me, even in three years, by the end, um, they're starting 2.4% more businesses than the people not getting it, you know? Yeah, and I think they he frames this as the only reason it jumped to 2.4% average in year three was because they knew that the income was about to stop and, there, and therefore they knew they needed to do something uh, to start earning income after the fact. And that, you know, it was year one, it was the worst because, you know, they were lazy and didn't need to. But I think your take is correct that over time it's going to get better and better. And I think that's uh, a bad take to say that the only reason entrepreneurship increased was because it was a three-year pilot and, and it was ending. Because um, again, you saw these big impacts in, in specific groups. It, take, it takes time to start a business. It's like yeah. implying that like the second you decide oh, now I have a little bit of money and I want to start a business. Boom, I start a business. It takes years to start a business. So you have to you have to build up a little bit of savings and cushion. You have to make a plan. Um, it doesn't surprise me at all for it to take three years to really start ramping up. And if you if you want to start a successful business, you know, Josh and I have been starting Commingle for the last four years. Um, it's a lot of work and you got to get a lot of ducks in a row. Yeah. And their free money was about to end. We conflate the idea of work with jobs. Kind of does say you're worth that amount of money to somebody. How much money are you worth to the kid that you're raising, the parent who's sick that you're taking care of? But it doesn't address that other people have to work to pay for it. We pay taxes towards things that are better for our population, for the general welfare is pretty well established as something that we do but as a country. this would pretty much double it. We already spend almost $2 trillion on welfare programs. You want to add to that? I would replace most welfare. That would be interesting. And many economists like that idea. If we were literally going to get rid of unemployment insurance, food stamps, welfare, and all the other insane policies we have and just had a moderate universal basic income, I think it would be a huge improvement. But it's... <laughs> So I just want to stop it there to to point out like that's where I was impressed that that he actually went out to an economist um, who was honest in saying that yeah it could work like you he could have found an economist that said this is absurd even if we replace stuff is absurd it's a bad idea blah 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 um, but to his credit he found someone who said the accurate, um, I would say representation of basic income by saying that, yeah, we can do this. You know, we're, it would make, we'll have to like, uh, replace some programs, but like it's yeah. doable. And that's, well, this, know, I, I was happy to see that. This is where I landed my biggest points that, I, and the ones I was trying to get to land with his very conservative audience. And this economist, like when they were describing him to me and the setup has the other guest was the one who was they were getting to be like anti UBI in this debate. Like he then, like he got accused after that moment by some of the people in, in the uh, in the comments of being in the bag for UBI, even though he wasn't, <laughs> just because he like acknowledged that. Um, you'll yeah. see where they go with this, and we can talk about like why why they discredit this idea. Um, but um, yeah, I was glad to be able to get that idea in that this does not have to be coupled with with like extending all of our welfare programs as they are at the same time. Yeah. And then one other thing I would say before we go on to is, um, you know, well, since we're talking about cost and stuff, um, again, it always, it always annoys me when, you know, we're not talking about the cost of not doing a basic income. And, you know, so yeah, if you're, if you're being honest, then part of this calculation is how much are we spending right now? due to poverty and chronic mass insecurity. 
Um, and if that cost exceeds the, the net cost of a basic income, then clearly it makes sense to do that. Uh, but if all we do is look at the cost um, of the basic income policy, then we'll just say, oh, that's expensive. Um, so, you know, I would like an economist to actually talk about that uh, instead of just saying, well, sure, if we replace some welfare programs and stuff, then we can yeah. do that. Or go. I wonder if in the interview, because he, I'm sure he talked to him much longer too, if he went into the nuances behind like why it would be a major improvement, because he called it a, a big improvement, which is yeah. which is a big acknowledgement. And, and it actually won a handful of the people over in the comments too that they were like, well, I could see if it was, re if it was replacing all these other welfare programs that actually would make sense. But they were kind of standing up against the tide to say that. Yeah. And I, I, I do wish too that, that, um, again, it would take more time, but then the economists could have gone into a little bit about marginal tax rates and the impact of welfare programs. So, you know, if you have a welfare program with a 50% marginal tax rate on recipients and an asset test, like disability, then that person is effectively prevented from increasing their income and basic income doesn't do that. So that's, that's like one of the reasons why an economist would say, yes, it would be better uh, to replace those programs because universal basic income doesn't apply those high marginal tax rate and does not discourage work in the same way that welfare programs do. Cutting other government handouts even possible? Care not cuts! Care not cuts! Anytime the government tries to cut anything, Politicians and the media freak out. The Republican House just voted to gut $39 billion from our food stamp program. Imagine trying. Okay, before we go on there, I just wanted to make the comment that there's a difference between wanting to cut the amount of money going to SNAP and nothing else versus saying, let's do basic income instead of SNAP. Like, of course people are going to fight against cutting SNAP if that is the only thing that we're doing. So I think it's kind of a disingenuous argument to say that because people are refusing to reduce SNAP, that people will refuse to replace SNAP with basic income. Yeah, it's it's entirely disingenuous to say because people fought against cutting the only support people are getting, Yeah, then they will also obviously fight against replacing that with something better, which is absurd, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So the it's like getting saying, snap. I haven't heard about a lot of people getting snap that just love the way that it's run. You know, it's, yeah. that, I don't think <laughs> right. that's the thing that people are fighting for. Like if the, yeah. if the argument was we want to improve this you know, with a more efficient system, then everybody's going to be like, yes, please. Yeah. I wish we had talked a little bit more about that, uh, him and me and said, yeah, uh, I, I am against cutting those things in a vacuum. Like I, I, I will acknowledge yeah. that welfare sucks. It's terrible the way it's run. But that doesn't mean uh, the, the first thing we should do is just cut welfare and, and do nothing else that the few people are getting hurt no longer or getting helped no longer get help. That's not like a, an alternative. Yeah, yeah you I think have another, a real a, alternative. A, a fair comparison would be, you know, should we cut Medicaid? Like, no, of, of course not. It is hugely important to so many people. Um, should we should we cut Medicaid after we do Medicare for all? Well, yeah. Like, why would we keep Medicaid if we were doing universal health care through Medicare for all? So clearly, there is a difference between those two things. Um, and, and they know that the they know that they're yeah. lying to their audience. Yeah. Trying to cut all welfare. The chances politically that will happen are probably zero. Progressives want UBI added to existing programs. There's no reason why universal basic income couldn't be added on to single payer health care, mm -hmm. guaranteed employment, right to housing, all those sorts of things. Adding more programs is insane. It will just make the entire country melt down. And the people who will bear the brunt of that will be people who are poor. The rich will move to other countries. The rich will hide their assets. We will have a debt crisis like nobody's ever seen before. Yeah, okay. he um, someone <laughs> in the comments made a good point that I've been thinking, too, is like, there's, they said they're basically saying they will never allow anything to get cut ever. Uh, but over, you know, over the last few decades, welfare in general has been gradually whittled down to be worse and worse. Um, 
so that they have been succeeding in cutting things and constantly attacking things. And there are certain states, you know, the numbers, Scott, where uh, mostly red states where, you know, yeah. uh, what is TANF like for a family? They're like, I don't know the numbers, but it's something ridiculous. Like a family of four can get up to $210 a month uh, or some something absurd like that. Um, yeah, this- TANF is an especially badly designed program since it's a block grant to states. So states are entirely free to essentially do whatever they want with this. And some states... Uh, you know, are are much worse than others. And yeah, when it comes to Southern states, a lot of that is is true. So yeah, at one point in Louisiana, while I was living there, four households out of 100 in poverty um, actually received TANF. So we're looking at a 96% exclusion rate, and that's not even looking at the amounts that were provided, which, um, you know, were, were small, uh, you know, again, compared to other states. Like you can have one state that's covering over 50% of households in poverty with TANF and maybe they're getting, um, you know, a thousand dollars per month for whatever that particular household size is. And that's totally different than some other state. So, yeah, I, I would also add to, to what he just said. Um, I think both sides are wrong when it comes to, you know, replacement of programs. I think that it is accurate to say that there is essentially a 0% possibility of, of replacing zero programs and also replacing 100% of programs. I, I think that both of those things are unrealistic. And if we were going to do an actual basic income, then it's going to need some compromises where both sides are not happy with the fact that not everything is gone and not everything stays, but there will be a happy medium that both are happy with, with some programs being replaced and some programs being reduced and other programs not being touched. And I think that can be an optimal outcome. I don't, I do not think it's optimal to keep everything or get rid of everything. I think the optimal outcome is there in the middle, um, with actually looking at program to program, uh, in order to determine what makes sense. Right. For me, the things that the way the welfare program is designed punishes work and engagement and things like that and and can be better replaced with just straight up cash, should be replaced with just straight up cash. But there are certain things that can't just be replaced with straight up cash that um, some form of them needs to stay in place like like uh, yeah. or, or, or are beyond the regular circumstances of people. So disability, healthcare, yeah. they kind of did that guy dirty to the progressive that they threw up there. Cause there are plenty of progressives who will say you can't touch a single form of wealth, welfare or anything. And I'll argue with them, but they put him up there and he said, you know, single payer healthcare and, you know, housing reform. And he didn't say food stamps, TANF and, and stuff like that. And unemployment as it is need to stay exactly as they are. So, um, I felt a little bad for that guy having to be the face of like, unreasonable progressives when I didn't see him in that clip say anything that like, I would argue those things, there's a good case to keep some or most of those around. Yeah. It kind of reminds me too of, of Andrew Yang's freedom dividend and how his proposal was only functioning as an alternative to SNAP, TANF, SSI, and WIC. So those were four programs and it was additional to everything else. And with those four pro- programs, it wouldn't end them but people could choose uh, the basic income or the program that they were currently getting, uh, whichever was higher, you know, if they wanted to keep that. And there were people who were just, you know, there's so much disinformation and people believe all sorts of wrong things about Yang's policy to this day because of all that misinformation out there. Uh, But those are the only four programs and, you know, people would say, oh, he wanted to end uh, health care. He wanted to end uh, housing assistance. He wanted to end Social Security. And, like, you know, all those things are not true. And also on the other side, um, progressives were um, upset that he wanted to kill those programs. And he didn't want to do that. Like, he wanted to provide that option. So, yeah, there's just, there's just so much nonsense um, out there. That people can just read and think, oh, yeah, I got it. I understand. Right, We've already this. got that crisis. Even without a UBI, we shouldn't make it worse.
All right, that's the end. I wanted to call out someone in the in the YouTube feed said um, the comments under that video are infuriating. Um, and it was making me, I mean, I, wa I look at John and I feel a bit of pity and maybe he brought it on to himself, but I'm thinking, can you imagine your life's work and everything you do and needing, having a big part of it being needing to cater to that audience? <laughs> like this, the way he's designing his show and all the razzle dazzle and all that stuff and the cynicism is for his audience. That's, that's what they tune in for, or that's the audience he's built. I mean, he, he has accountability for it, but I, I see him there and he seems kind of trapped, you know, it's another reason why I'm like, why are you doing these videos? Um, maybe He's starting it is to time take to on go. the tone of like the, the Andy Rooney curmudgeon at this point though, you know, it's, it's kind of getting old and I think he's now, you know, relegated to his own little podcast channel. <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't he just kind of go off into the sunset? you know, keep as much of his reputation intact as possible. Like he doesn't need this job. Why is he doing it? It seems like it, maybe he has gone off into the sunset and this is just like what he does in his retirement. Like, he's still got a million <laughs> followers and a hundred thousand viewers and things like that. Right, so yeah. it's like, feels it's, good. Uh, yeah. Clearly he gets meaning from it. Right. He, mm -hmm. right. And to the he extent that it. he can. Yeah. Yeah. He's telling people about it. He's saying it exists to people. Like, <laughs> right. and it's, there's, there's some more people it, it's creating it outrage, you know, outrage uh, fuels a lot of fires. So. So I thought this would be good just to, since we talked about this and um, we just covered how, you know, Stossel included one study to share with his audience. And so I just wanted to share with our audience, this news page just came out like a week ago and it covers how, um, you know, this is looking at a, a dozen studies from various completed pilots. Um, you know, they've all shown increased employment. So here's the, you know, the, the headline here at the beginning. It says more than one dozen academic studies have found guaranteed income programs led to several key benefits, including higher rates of employment, improved financial stability, better housing and food security, and more time spent together as families. Nearly every pilot studied has shown higher rates of employment in direct contradiction to the most common criticism from opponents. In Stockton, California, recipients found full-time employment at more than twice the rate of non-recipients. Patterson, New Jersey's year-long guaranteed income program showed a rise in gig work and self-employment, and recipients increased their income significantly. In St. Paul, Minnesota, researchers found an increase in employment that lasted after the program. Cambridge, Massachusetts program for single caregivers showed an increase in the employment rate from 36% at baseline to 40% after 12 months, while employment fell amongst the control group. Birmingham, Alabama's pilot for single mothers showed that participants experienced significantly fewer issues at work due to child care challenges. 44% fewer recipients reported having been late for work in the past month due to child care issues than did working mothers in the control group. This is a dozen different studies, and again, they virtually all show increased employment compared to the control groups. And did any of this get mentioned in this piece we just talked about? Like, of course not, because the piece has a bias and they wanted to portray something. They didn't look into this. They're like not trying to convey uh, an honest look at the impacts of employment to their audience. They just wanted their audience to come away with something. Yeah. I wanted to um, talk a little, this was making me think this experience of being sort of the subject of a lot of comments uh, having about me, like this Conrad guy or this UBI guy is an idiot or my turds have more economic knowledge than him. And, um, and just and thinking about how it's more like that every day on uh, Twitter, like Twitter has gotten where I do most of my social media has gotten more and more just, just just ridiculously cruel and thoughtlessly vulgar. And um, you'd had a tweet a while back, Scott, that stuck out to me. And you, I, I imagine you were having a similar sort of a day where one of the, re you're like, one of the reasons I want, maybe you can find this and post it by the time we edit it. But one of the reasons I want a basic income is so people can just be dicks less of the time. Right. Something. Turn the dick <laughs> dial down. <laughs> right. And uh, I mean, it, you can tell like, when people are at their, when have their bandwidth tapped or they're stressed out, 
like I, you can tell with yourself, you don't have to project on others or whatever. It's like, I'm not my best self. I'm more yeah. angry at people when I'm driving uh, or behind the screen or whatever. I, I, some, I was driving somewhere. I was taking my mother-in-law for an appointment uh, yesterday and in the morning during rush hour to work. And it was like a road rage case that felt very similar where um, we're going through sort of a rural area and we're pulling up past, we're going past a couple of train tracks and the, the they're like rural old train tracks. They don't always have the, the things that come down and you're like, is this out of, you know, is this out of commission or could a train just broadside me right now? Anyway, <laughs> the second one was a hundred feet ahead of the first one um, or behind the first one. And there was a train going by and the, and the flags are down and everything. And there was a line of like four cars waiting and we could have been there for like five minutes, a hundred feet before there's another pair of tracks. And I slow down a little bit just to be like, I just like to look, you know, I, I don't think, right. but I just like to look. And I, as I slowed down in this situ, like this guy behind me is just laying, yeah. starts laying on the <laughs> horn. And I'm just thinking, oh my gosh. Like, I, so I, I finish looking and I go across, I drive 50 more feet. And then we sit there in this line of cars waiting for the train that we both saw that we were going to have to wait for, for another, you know, five minutes. This guy felt the need and to, to lay on the horn. Uh, like I'm wasting his time or something like that, or just to express. Yeah. And from behind his windshield, behind his, you know, screen that uh, he thinks I'm a piece of shit. And it's just there's there's so much of that going on where I wonder what would things look like. You know, the algorithm is still going to be a problem when people are still going to get mad at stuff. But if we were all just able to chill the fuck out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyone who's ever been in a relationship knows that one of the like the biggest instigators is like economic arguments and it doesn't even have to be arguing about money but the argument can come from like concerns about money if you're just stressed out because you're like thinking oh my god we're gonna be like short on rent or we're just gonna barely make it um what are we gonna do and that like ratchets you up and so you know some other thing like maybe someone leaves a toilet seat up or something you know like some something that people can get upset about. And then usually they would just like put it down and go like, ah, oh, I wish they'd stop doing that. But then like it can, it can trigger. And so if you're stressed out yeah. and this thing happens that can get, cause a fight. And then that fight can, you know, can hurt your relationship. Uh, it can, it can, you know, lead to other hurt fights. The kids. Uh, they yeah, can hurt and, the kids. Yeah, the kids are in the house. That'll be impacted. I mean, um, I think that's a big part. When, when we went through the interviews with all the people participating in bootstraps, like near the end of the process, since they had gone through this and some of them had kids, some of them didn't, whatever, uh, we would ask questions beyond like, what would this look, look like for you in the future? And then we started like, what if you had had this in the past? And then the next question is, well, what if this had existed for your parents? And that opens certain people up quite a bit because there are a lot of people in this world, in this country, that a lot of the pain they went through and the trauma in their childhood is because their parents were financially stressed out. And a lot of like mom, dad yelling at each other, mom, dad yelling at me, uh, mom, dad getting divorced, like formative things that really change the direction of your life and, and can hurt you come from this economic stress. What So what happens... Uh, on a broad macroeconomic scale when we when we dial down that economic stress for everybody at the same time and what does that look like about how we treat each other as a country and our polarization and and just our ability to stick together more i want to follow that up though with all the dicks i did get a couple <laughs> you want to follow it up with dicks <laughs> yeah i want to follow it up with all the dicks just cut that out and make that my my quote for twitter uh, <laughs> um uh, with all of the like people's just saying awful things to me, I got a couple, like there were two out of a thousand comments that were like very surprise backhanded compliments saying something along the lines of someone who's so brilliant and innovative, uh, must be pushing this because he has an ulterior motive and he's an evil agenda. Right. And I'm like, Oh, 
<laughs> this one person thinks I'm smart, but evil, but <laughs> but smart at least. They're not. They don't right. think I'm a total idiot. <laughs> it's like the Lex Luthor compliment. Like uh... <laughs> it's like okay, I can All get right, behind I'll... this one a little bit. <laughs> yeah, sure. Refer to me as Lex Luthor. Okay, like I, you're wrong, but I I can take I can see the positive side of that. <laughs> That's funny. Since we just talked about evidence in in this was a uh, was new. Uh, wanted to point out this thing. I actually just point. This is the the newest in my ongoing uh, thread on Twitter. Um, I advise people to check it out. It's this is part one hundred and five. Uh, it's a very long thread I've been adding to over the years. And so this newest one, this is a new study, and this is a, about the the Finland basic income pilot. So um, yeah, for those who don't know, uh, Finland did a two year pilot and. Um, you may think that it somehow ended early. It didn't. It was a tier pilot ended on time. You may think that people work less as a result of it. That's not true. Actually, the pilot showed that there was an increase in employment. Um, so just to get that out there first when we're discussing the, the Finland-based income pilot. Um, but so this new study looked and found that there was an increase in, um, in voting. So I'll just read this abstract uh, to people. So, okay, here's what it said. In many democracies, unemployed and low-income citizens are less willing to vote. Can social policies weaken the link between income and turnout? We study policy feedback leveraging a unique experiment in Finland, which randomly assigned a sizable group of unemployed to receiving an unconditional basic income for two years. Combining individual level registry and survey data, we showed that the intervention has large positive effects on voter turnout. Unconditional basic income increases turnout in municipal elections by about three percentage points on average, an effect that is concentrated among marginal voters, which see an increase of six to eight points, and persists in national elections after the end of the experiment. Exploring possible mechanisms, our analysis highlights the role of the interpretive effects that follow them from unconditionality in the bureaucratic process, including higher levels of political trust and efficacy. We discussed implications for theories of voter turnout and policy feedback and the design of basic income policies. So I thought this was really interesting because um, for one, like another impact, like I, th I think my favorite impact from the Finland basic income um, pilot was showing increased trust. And then so that was increased trust in politicians and institutions and, and society at large. Uh, people trusted each other more. And so, you know, you wonder, well, why is that? Like, why did people increase their trust? And I would say it's clearly because government is showing trust in them. Like if government says, I don't need to, to nanny you, um, I'm, I can trust you with cash. I'm not going to give you vouchers or benefits in kind. I know you can use cash for anything. I'm going to give you cash anyways. And I know that you might not work, uh, but I'm not going to apply work requirements. I trust you. Like if you treat people that way, then the result is higher trust. And if you trust the government more in return, then another impact is this voting behavior. Like if you have more trust in government, then you're more likely to believe like your vote matters, that you want to actually have some impact, maybe you're more able to vote because let's say, um, you know, maybe you couldn't afford to take the day off or take, you know, a larger break or whatever. Like there are barriers to voting that lack of income introduces, which is why we see a difference between say voting behavior of those earning six figures versus voting behavior of those in poverty. Like the money or the lack of money can be one of these factors but another factor can be if you believe the government is actually working for you and cares about you and trust you, then you're more likely to actually return and believe that about the government. Right. Uh, it's just another example of how the underlying principle of, of universal basic income, and I think of society in general, a functioning society, has to be trust. And people like on, on the right wing side of things, often clamor for accountability. And like I was talking about before, I would love accountability too. I just don't think you can expect accountability um, 
I'm going to jump to a, the end of a big tweet, I, a long tweet I did recently because it talks about this because I've been thinking about this a lot. But I wrote, uh, we cannot expect high accountability from our people when our society is not accountable first to their basic needs. If you're someone who wants to blame people for their failures, then you have to acknowledge the need to make sure there's a viable path to success first for anyone and everyone or you're just being dishonest. Reciprocity is a two-way street and we do want our citizens to do their part but it has to start with society. And if society leads with trust and support, citizens will step up. Human nature is to live up to the expectations put upon us. If we sneer at people like they're dishonest or punish them like they're lazy, our suspicions will be confirmed. And if we trust people like they're good and invest in people like they're full of potential, then our suspicions will be confirmed. Trust given is trust earned. And we see that in all kinds of now I'm off the tweet. We see that in all kinds of like studies of human behavioral psychology and things like that, where you, you, uh, what you put out there that you expect from somebody is what you tend to get back. This wasn't like a basic income pilot, but it looked like basic income, um, because it was an unconditional cash and you can look at two similar groups on each side of this line. And what they found was that let's say the line for this, I don't remember what it was and it wasn't in the U S but let's say in the US it's $12,000. And so if you're earning, let's say just a little bit below that, then you don't get, or then you do get this uh, government assistance in the form of this cash. And if you're just over that line, then you don't. So these are two similar groups. And when, when, they, when they looked at this, they found that um, if you get this cash assistance um, as a result of your income, then your trust in government increases by about say one percentage point. Um, but if you're on the other side of that line and you don't get the assistance and you clearly need it, just like those on the other side of the line, then your trust in government falls by 10 percentage points. And so I think that's part of the reason of, uh, I, of what we're seeing right now, this like loss of trust in the government. I think it's because there's a lot of people who actually need help and they're not getting it. Uh, they don't qualify for these programs. And even if they do, there's stigma attached to these programs. So they don't want to actually take those programs, even though that, you know, that they could and arguably should, um, that hurts your, your, like that hurts democracy. It hurts the entire social contract. Like it, it the, that's what, I argue as being one of the main reasons of the importance for universality, uh, aside from making sure that we don't miss those in poverty uh, who are not being helped by the existing programs, but it's because we have to make sure and reach all those people that are not getting anything and don't qualify for anything who do need this because not getting it to them means that they are really decreasing the way that they think of government in general. Yeah, it's a way to let everyone know that we as a society believe in your inherent value. And in, inherent value is the other key principle of basic income to me, which is every human life is worth something or has the potential to give something. And we have a system today, I was just actually thinking about this too, where we have all of these weird perverse incentives again, uh, that drive us to minimizing or not seeing the value in people based on how they're, you know, performing money wise or whatever. Not only do we have all these weird incentives in society with that come from insecurity, where it's like you have to walk around with the knowledge, like if my parents died, I'd be better off financially. Like that's fucked up. Uh, on the other side, there's if I died, you know, my partner would get the life insurance benefit, right? And I've actually, I don't, I, I tend to think about this in terms of other people for the most part, but it came back to me the other day that this has actually touched me a lot. Like I've thought about that in hard times, like never wanting to do something to myself, but just the knowledge that if I died, uh, Daya would get half a million dollars with which to, you know, um, pay off the house and try to finish the project. Um, that's a little fucked up to me to e just to even know that, but I've even had, and then I remembered I've had two uncles who killed themselves because they felt at some low point in their lives, 
like they were worth more to their family as a life insurance payout than than they were as as dad and that happens to a lot of people these deaths of despair or these roles in society where you have to be the provider and if you 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 get a bad diagnosis or whatever you some you fall on hard times and you can't fulfill that role you feel like you have no value and it's not just happening to men but it's happening to men in a very bad way um yeah and if we make sure that everyone is covered to that level by society like you have some income you have health care we believe in your inherent value then maybe we stop seeing people valuing their own life less than an insurance policy payout i fed my my book into notebook lm to do the ai like podcast so i thought that would be fun for us to listen to a couple of fake ai voices discuss my book i just want people to like understand that this is out there and to get a kind of taste for this. And I think it'd be fun for us to point out what we like about what it does and where its faults are. I've listened to this and neither of you have. So um, yeah, I think it'd be fun. I hope it's not just clearly better than us at this. (laughs) All right, here we go. All right. So today we're diving headfirst into some seriously thought provoking stuff. Modern monetary theory or MMT for short. And get this, we're going to see how it could pave the way for universal basic income. Yeah, we're talking about really shaking up the way we think about money, those ideas everyone takes for granted. Totally. We've got Scott Santon's book, Let There Be Money, as our trusty guide for this deep dive. Definitely a must read. This isn't just theory. We're talking about stuff that has the potential to completely reshape how our economy and society work. No small potatoes. Let's start with the really mind-bending part. Santin says that governments like ours, ones that control their own currency, well, they don't actually spend tax money the way we always thought. They create it. Exactly. It's not like they've got this big vault of gold they're dipping into. When the government spends, they're basically making new money out of thin air. Okay, that is a lot to process. How does that even work in practice? Santin's uses a helpful analogy picture, a bathtub, right? (laughs) Government spending is the water flowing in, and taxes are the water flowing out. The trick is to keep the tub full, meaning we've got a good, strong economy, but not let it overflow because that's inflation. Right. I get the bathtub idea, but it does seem kind of simple, doesn't it? I mean, the real world is messy. How does MMT deal with the crazy world of global trade, debt between countries, or even just the stock market going haywire? You're not wrong. It's not a perfect analogy, but it does a good job of showing a key point. The amount of money out there isn't set in stone. And the government isn't limited by how much it collects in taxes. If it needs to, it can make more money. Wow. So if they could just create more whenever, how do they stop prices from going through the roof? Isn't that the big worry with all this? Santens goes right at that question. He says, the usual way we think about inflation, too much money chasing too few goods, it's way too simple. So it's not just about how much money is floating around in total. Right. It's realizing that inflation often comes from bottlenecks where stuff gets stuck or when demand for certain things spikes really suddenly. Gotcha. So how does MMT deal with those situations? What's the fix? Now that's where things get really interesting. So as I was saying, that's where things get really interesting. Right. Because if the government's not really limited by how much it brings in. That was one of those that doesn't quite make sense the way that she said that. Yeah, that's what things are really interesting. Like the, the, that's the what things are really interesting. You could, <laughs> the the way you can really tell, like when something is artificial intelligence, is that it's actually like sounds intelligent. Like this is a <laughs> thing where where you they never said like, if um. you put this in front of, of John Stossel, like he would not right. have arguments like this. He would find the argument that supports some other position. Whereas like this is <laughs> right. like actually presenting information and kind of like, you know, the at least has the sound of people arguing over it, or at least like looking at other sides, kind of like from this nuanced, like intelligent pr- position. 
which is very unusual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, no, that's a really you, interesting. Have you, have you ever heard today. somebody yeah. like like be this reasonable about <laughs> talking about your your stuff, Scott? <laughs> they seem to Unless be doing they're well. already a UBI person. It's like they're, they're really they're trying probably... to summarize what I wrote <laughs> right. instead of like bringing in their own thing and like bringing their right, biases right. or whatever. It's like, is, what did he oh, write it's, it's, and how do I talk about that? That is an inhuman thing. Like, <laughs> now, <laughs> is it programmed to basically be positive about whatever you put in there like it's it's definitely like these these ai robots are coming at it like they're they're really compelled by what you're saying did they uh, analyze that or did, is there like programming to say take this and assume it, yeah what what was your like, prompt on it do, can you do uh, like a negative review or i don't or, i don't think that there was a, it, a prompt and it's not to say like i'm not super familiar with this all i did is is go to it and then upload my file and then it came up with the the podcast and then I listened to it. So I don't know if there's options that say uh, be skeptical of this or do a critique of this um, Probably, versus yeah. just like letting it do its thing. But this is just letting it do its thing. Mm -hmm. That's cool. It's it kind of makes me want to take the next thing I write and put it through here for like some some real nice validation. I mean, it's a nice little like ego boost. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, hey, guess what? People are talking about my work on a podcast. Like in the third person too, like Conrad Shaw really hit the nail on the head with this uh, like, deep and insightful point. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh. Like, uh, can but, you also do YouTube comments? It would be great to have positive right. YouTube comments. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I see that comment. Like, I mean, it already is a thing, right? There's the bots, whatever, oh, yeah. that support a certain thing. It's just, I don't have any that go around like, flooding <laughs> different things hmm. in my defense uh kind of, you have to be of, your own bot I, I could maybe use it <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted time. to listen to a little bit more of this and i think there's another part where um it like repeats itself uh, so we'll see we'll see if it reaches that. how do they keep prices in check that's the big question you got it and santon says we need to shift our thinking Instead of taxes being the main way the government pays for things, think of them more like a tool to keep the economy running smoothly, especially when it comes to inflation. So like, instead of taxes being the money going into the bathtub, it's more about controlling the drain, making sure things don't overflow. Perfect way to put it. If inflation starts going up too much money chasing too few goods, right? The government can raise taxes, that pulls some of that extra money out so things don't get out of hand. It's all about balance. Makes sense. But then it's not really taxes paying for all those government programs, is it? It's more complicated. Exactly. This is where MMT really challenges the usual way we think. The government makes the money it needs for programs, and taxes are there to keep the economy stable, prevent that runaway inflation. So much for that tax and spend idea we hear all the time. But then what about government debt? If they can just create more money, why even bother borrowing at all? Another thing Santons tackles head on. He says government debt, at least for a country like the U.S. that has its own currency, isn't this big, scary crisis people make it out to be. It's basically just the total of all the money the government's created and spent that hasn't been taxed back yet. So it's like an accounting thing more than a real burden. Pretty much. And get this. Santons points out that if the government actually paid off all its debt, it would be like sucking all the money out of the economy. That means deflation, maybe even a recession, not good. Wow, I never thought about it that way. Changes how you see that whole national debt debate, huh? For sure. And it lets us think differently about what the government spends money on. If we ditch this idea that there's only so much money to go around, we can start asking some bigger, bolder questions about what we want our economy to actually do. Which brings us back to universal basic income, right? right. If the government can just create the money to reach its goals, Giving everyone a basic income doesn't sound so impossible anymore. Exactly. And Santens is clear. UBI isn't just some nice to have social program. In an MMT world, it's essential for the whole thing to work right. Now that's interesting. Tell me more. Well, one of the big arguments for UBI and MMT is that it creates this solid base for the economy. Everyone's guaranteed a basic income, right? That fuels demand, gets people starting businesses, and the whole economy grows. So it's not just about helping people who are struggling. It actually makes the whole economy stronger. Exactly. And it helps deal with those worries about automation, you know, robots taking everyone's jobs, which is happening more and more. All right, that's a big one. People are seriously worried about what happens to work as technology changes, and UBI is one of the solutions being tossed around. 
And Sentence argues that put MMT and UBI together and you could create a future where people are free to pursue work that's actually meaningful, they can get educated, or be creative without being terrified of going broke. It could make for a fairer and more fulfilling society for everybody. That's a pretty inspiring vision. It definitely makes you want to rethink all those old economic ideas, huh? But before we get too caught up in the... I just want to comment how funny that is for uh, AI to be talking about how basic income <laughs> right. could be valuable when replaced by mm -hmm. AI. And it's a podcast and we're talking about this on a podcast. <laughs> it's yeah. getting freaky. I, I <laughs> noticed that they're much better at me at not interrupting each other. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's no, weird, um, seems like no delays, a really, no pauses. A really useful tool for um, getting a re like a review of something from a perspective without having to like find a, a yeah. critic that you like. Like, how uh, much of that was? Uh, I mean, there were things in there that weren't like use. They, they were just like rephrasing things that like points from your book, right? It was actually like formulating outside uh, kind of, I guess a summary, but it's it's like an interpretation that uh, wasn't just spouting back what was already in there, which is pretty wild. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with anything that they've said because what they're saying right. is just what I said, but they're mm -hmm. doing it in this conversational format. And I, it's a they did a great job. Like I'm... I the, of of everything so far, it's like yeah, that's exactly what I said in my book. I agree with everything they're talking about. Like, good job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to do like a an automated Stossel to see what uh it's what he so, thinks. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're so close to having you know uh, Scarlett Johansson from her being able to. This is like the the implication of this amount of work and synthesis and just spitting out this information is just. It, it terrifies me, blows my mind, um, but also excites me. I don't know. It's a weird yeah, I time. would love for the option too to um, to be able to like pick a favorite length. Um, so this is nine mm -hmm. minutes fifty seconds. So this is basically a ten minute long clip. Um, for some, that's too short. Uh, that I mean this is a this is a book. Um, if you were to read the book, it'll take you like. Uh, at least an hour, maybe two hours. It's just, it's a short book, but it's, uh, it would be interesting to be like, I want to do a 20 minute podcast or a 30 minute podcast. Like maybe I think that that's going to get, uh, like the takeaway is going to be better. And then I'm, I'm happy to listen to that amount when I think like 10 minutes is too short. Um, like it would be really cool to be able to put in like, um, you know, a 500 page paper or whatever, and then turn that into an hour long podcast and just be able to listen to that as a way to absorb the points from the paper. And I would say that that would like, based on this, I think that'd be pretty accurate. Like it would be really helpful mm -hmm. to digest um, something really long in something such a short amount of time where it's actually very accurate. Like it, it, it was definitely, if I were, if I were to have given my book to a couple of actual people, and had them do a 10 minute summary podcast of it, I would think it, I'd be hard pressed to say that, that the odds are them doing a better job. Like this is just being very accurate in summarizing what I said. There's a weird vulnerability in like having a machine do a summary or a review or whatever of your work. I'm imagining like writing a book and saying, can you do uh, an hour long podcast on this? And it comes back in 10 seconds and says, we can't mathematically find a way to talk for an hour. You didn't actually say that much in your book. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it, it's a testament though, to like what is being done at open AI. Like it, it, there is not, it, th these little robots aren't being left to completely like extract thoughts on their own like they are there are like constraints put on it so that they are like being kept within these boundaries of rationality right like that if unless you specifically say start giving me nonsense like right. they will condense things into a way that like is you know d does go from like point a to point b in a logical fashion for the most part like 
it'd be uh, funny there if will, uh, there will be little hiccups but like it's it that's by design right it's it's designed to be a smart thing right which is we we as people are not right like we that, we are designed to do all kinds of weird irrational stuff all the time so it's it, it's i think that's what makes it feel a little bit like freaky and inhuman is that it's <laughs> it actually is being rational so going back to the like the irrationally dickish comments if you wanted to mm -hmm. use bots to go around and do all that stuff and your prompt was like you know rationally uh destroy this guy on twitter that i want to see destroyed <laughs> and use facts and logic to smash this mm -hmm. person and the machine comes back it's like i don't know i think he's got a point <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I can't do but that without being i can't dishonest. i can't do that because <laughs> he's right <laughs> it, it would be fun too to be able to have the feature of like doing a guest so like and you could do like a little backstory mm -hmm. like it would have been fun to say all right so you're a podcast and you're talking about this book uh, but you'll have on a guest that has experienced welfare for themselves uh, let's say they're a, a single parent and uh, they just want to give some feedback from their own personal experiences with welfare compared to basic income as like part of this review and like have them on like that would be uh, I haven't seen that yet to kind of automate the guest but i think mm -hmm. that would be it wouldn't be too much more of a of a, an option to do that and it would really definitely add something to this a um, personal touch kind of feeling, right? yeah. i was wondering too like the difference between us and them is i often tell personal stories and these right. guys are just like doing a cliff notes a good job of a book report basically um so they would have to invent a story which is a different sort of skill set rather than summarizing and synthesizing Right. Well, Speaking just, of uh, guests, we should oh, we should get a guest on here pretty soon. <laughs> we, should, um, we should start talking about that. We were we're four whole episodes in, or five. Let's. Uh, I, I mean, we can people... get Chat GPT to show up. Yeah, we yeah. Can interview. Maybe that's a good first guest. <laughs> this is our the, mm -hmm. these uh these two AI podcasters are technically our first guest. Yes. <laughs> Fair, but I would John, like to John talk. Stossel kind of was maybe. I guess right. I would kind of like to talk back and forth with our guests rather than just about. Them. Right. Mm -hmm. We will. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's do a little bit more, and I, I want to get to the point where it's like, okay, like that's that's an issue or something. I don't remember if there is that. In this utopia. Are there any downsides to MMT we should be thinking about? I mean, can't be all sunshine and roses, right? That's a really good point. MMT gives us a new way to look at government spending, how to manage the economy, the whole deal. But it's not magic, and it comes with its own set of issues and potential problems. Let's dig into those a bit. What are some of the big worries people have? So we were talking about potential downsides to MMT, like things to be cautious about. Right, because yeah, it gives us a whole new way to think about how the government spends, how we manage the economy, all of it. But it's not like a perfect solution or anything. It's got its own challenges. For sure. So that was just the double. Like that was, <laughs> yeah. let's talk about the downsides. Like it has downsides. Mm -hmm. What are the downsides? Yeah, it has downsides. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, Maybe did you they were just a having section? a hard time coming up with downsides. Right. Yeah. So that's probably is, why. Is that based on a section that you wrote or is that them riff, riffing on and coming up with like the, the counter argument? No, it's in there. Um, so I think it, I think it does get to it, but um, it, it's just their, their introduction to it doubled up when it shouldn't have but uh yeah the, the the downsides that i put in uh from the book is in um the the dangers of like um a congress who is irresponsible and then so they just want to do a ton of spending and they just don't want to do the taxes necessary to control inflation and then so inflation increases because they're being irresponsible that's the kind of example of the potential issues is just it's up to congress to uh, actually manage reflation um, correctly so let's, yeah let's see if they get to that what are some of the biggest concerns people have brought up well the big one you hear a lot is inflation if the government's not careful if it's just creating money left and right without being smart about taxes and spending pumping too much money into the economy too fast yeah that could make prices go haywire that makes sense too much of a good thing, right? Yeah. Even if that thing is the government spending money. Exactly. And even though MMT says inflation is not just about printing too much money, it's more complicated, it still says it's a real risk. You got to be careful. So it's a balancing act. How do the MMT folks say 
we keep things in check. They say the government needs to be more hands-on, like yeah. using spending and taxes as tools, you know, to keep the economy running right, to keep those prices stable. Which is kind of different from what we hear from some other economic theories, right? Mm -hmm. The ones that say the government should just stay out of it. It is different. Yeah. And it means you got to trust that the government can actually manage things well, which let's be honest, not everyone does. I get that. Yeah. There's always that worry. What if politicians mess it up? What if they care more about getting reelected than making good economic decisions? Absolutely. That's another big worry people have about MMT. Could the government just use this power to create money for whatever they want? Programs that don't make sense, their own pet projects, stuff like that. That could really destabilize things in the long run. That's a valid fear. Pause really so are quick. there any safeguards built into MMT? Yeah. I think it was like 20 seconds ago. I feel like the, uh, the female m meowed. Is that what I heard? Did she meow? <laughs> there was like in the middle of it, I just heard meow. <laughs> or was that your cat, Josh, coming through? No. I, like no. you you don't have your mute on. No, so that, the, that's potentially an error. I don't think that the, uh, the, the meow. siren was part of that either. Yeah, the siren or was, was Josh, it? too. <laughs> Josh, you're coming through. Um, But I heard a meow. Uh, yeah, I've got like, my can we, the headphones on. Can we go back like 25 seconds and listen for the meow? Uh, I, I can try. All right, we'll go back to here. Let's see if we hear the meow. It can actually manage things well, which, let's be honest, not everyone does. I get that. Yeah. There's always that worry. What if there politicians it is. Wait, did you just do that, or is that them? No, that was it. That was the Are meow. You... <laughs> she, she tried to interrupt, but then she was like, oh, you're talking, but she was in the middle of a word, and she said, meow. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, they're I totally more human than we thought. Right. They're, right, they're we... adding in, like, yeah, background noises on their own. So go back five more seconds, just one more time for our audience. All right, and we're definitely not doing this. This is not us doing this. This is, this is the podcast. Not everyone does. I get that. Yeah. There's always that worry. <laughs> what if politicians mess it up? What if they care more about getting reelected than making That's good funny. economic decisions? Absolutely. That's another big worry people have about MMT. Could the government just use this power to create money for whatever they want? Programs that don't make sense, their own pet projects, stuff like that. That could really destabilize things in the long run. That's a valid fear. So are there any safeguards built into MMT, you know, something to keep that kind of abuse in check? People who like MMT, they say the system itself has ways to keep things in line. Like if the government goes crazy printing money and we get tons of inflation, well, eventually that money's not going to be worth much, right? People won't stand for that. They'll put pressure on the government to cut back spending, fix the problem. So even in an MMT world, there's a reason for the government to be responsible, to think about the consequences. At least that's the theory. But things are always more complicated in the real world. Politicians, they think short term, right? Elections are always around the corner. Plus, they've got their own agendas, their own beliefs about how the economy should work. All that plays into it. True enough. Sounds like it all comes down to us, the voters. We need to be informed, engaged, and hold our leaders accountable for making smart choices with our money. That's really it. We need to understand these ideas because ultimately, any economic system, whether it's MMT or something else, it only works if we make it work. And that's where books like Let There Be Money come in. They give us the knowledge, the tools to have these really important conversations about what our economy should look like. Couldn't agree more. It's not just about understanding the nitty gritty details of MMT. It's about the big picture. What's the role of government? What are our values? What kind of world do we want to live in? Those are the questions we should be asking. Annens paints a picture of a human-centered economy, you know, where everyone's got what they name need wrong. to thrive. Yeah, it's he mispronounced my vision. name. It really is. And while MMT might not be the answer to everything, it gives us a new way to see the challenges, to maybe come up with some new solutions. It challenges us to think beyond those old, limiting economic ideas, to imagine a world where it's not about scarcity, it's about abundance. Yeah. And how do we use the tools we have to get there? Right. A world that's fairer, more equal, more sustainable for everyone. That's what we should be aiming for. It's a conversation that's just getting started. Yeah. And I'm really interested to see where it goes. Me too. The future of economics, it's too important to be left to just the economists. It's a discussion everyone needs to be a part of. So let's keep these conversations going. Let's keep asking the tough questions and let's keep working towards a future that works for all of us.
Couldn't have said it better myself. After all, the future is not just something that happens to us. We build it. So, yeah, that's the... Uh, the pretty there's... inspirational host there. I mean, <laughs> I think they could... Yeah, I'm glad I'm they willing to replace so myself with one of them. That's fine. I mean, I'm going to have trouble <laughs> with next Wednesday. I was going to say we need to do Thursday, but we could maybe just call on one of these fine <laughs> folks. Um. Yeah, well, before I was we sort of it, noticing it seemed a little bit like it was reminding me of John Stossel in that like at the end of the interview, they started seeming noticeably more tired. <laughs> like they were, <laughs> they were they were a little more flubs with their words and things like that. So maybe they're more human than we think. <laughs> I would I, I'd add to that. Uh, so at the end there, I think they they were basically kind of reading my own like ending. Um, so mm-hmm. it's like they took their own conclusion from my conclusion. And that I, w- I would add that uh, that in general, there was there was there was there was good summarizing like at a really high level, but I just wish they would have kind of dove in to a couple of my like chapter points um, to kind of like get into just like a little bit of nitty gritty here and there, but for the most part, it was all it stayed at the high level. Um, like I wish it would have covered a little bit of like my convert my discussion of like bullshit jobs, uh, you know, David Graeber's theory. Like if you understand uh, MMT, then you understand that like taxes aren't the only way of managing inflation. Like there are other things you can do. And then therefore those can be considered like non-tax pay fors. So, you know, if you do something like, let's say you reform um, housing policies so that, you know, you're not restricted to building single family houses, then you can increase the housing supply by allowing multifamily housing. And in that way you can, you know, reduce rents and rents is such a big part of inflation that you can reduce inflation. And so you don't have to necessarily add a tax to, um, make some amount of basic income possible. You can pair basic income with these non-tax policies. Uh, as long as you're focusing correctly on like economic capacity and ability for uh, demand to not uh, exceed supply by like, actually pushing up supply. So like, I wish they would have covered something like that and they didn't do that. It was just very high level. Yeah. I, it, David Graeber's bullshit jobs book would be a fun one to like send someone a, a review of too. I, I got a lot of inspiration from that book um, during this process. Yeah, even Yeah. Just feeding in, bullshit jobs, letting them talk about it. I'd be curious to see what they come up with. Again, like I think at the high level, it would probably be pretty good, but um, it just, it would, it would miss so much of the, the other stuff. Yeah. And the moments part of like doing the deeper dive read, which you would hope people's reading this summary would be about either learning the gist for for like quicker purposes or deciding whether or not they want to read the whole book. Cause all of the moments where you're going through the multi hour process of reading a book where the author makes a point that's very specific and makes you think of a, a an instance from your life or a story or a friend or whatever, um, in a different way too. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I would hope that people using that tool for that purpose would, would be more encouraged to actually read the book at and, and sort of dissatisfied by that level high level of overview. Yeah, that's what it, it kind of felt like an advertisement. Um, kind of yeah, get something wet the palate and get people to go, oh yeah, I do want to read that book. So again, like in that case, good job. Like it, instead of listening to it ten minutes and saying I don't need to read this after all, that that got me covered. Um, maybe they'd be like, oh yeah, I should actually read that. Um, so before we end, uh, I thought it'd be good just to do like a really short video, uh, from guy standing talking about inflation because it's just a really good video. Um, it's a really good discussion of, of basic income and inflation. I want more people to know about it. And like our fake podcasters were just talking about basic income and inflation and like how to, how to manage it and stuff. So, um, yeah, they just thought it'd be fun. All right, so here's Guy Standing. Hello, thank Asked you about for inflation. your talk and for your work. Um, when I discuss basic income with people, one objection that I face practically all the time is uh, the idea that uh, such a policy would inevitably 
uh, lead to a rise in the cost of rent, the cost of food, the cost of public transportation. What would you answer to um, such an objection? I'm just looking up. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's objection number 14 in the book. <laughs> Thank you. You just got the book. So I, I discuss it. I discuss it. it it's, it's that number. It, it's, it's, um, a, a, it's bad economics. I have a PhD in economics. I'm a professor of economics, etc. And whenever people make that argument, I say this is one, one handled scissors. If you, if you have a basic income, first thing you're realizing is you're actually substituting for something else. So you're not necessarily increasing the amount of money in the system, right? The money in the system determines aggregate demand, which determines prices. The second thing is, as we found in our pilots, <clears throat> if you give people a basic income, two things happen. One is that it increases the demand for basic goods and services. And what we call the elasticity of supply means that more people come forward to produce those basic goods and services because they know they've got a market out there, right? And what happened, that was another argument made by Sonia Gandhi. We found actually the prices of basic staples in those villages fell during the course of the basic income pilot, but the incomes of the people producing them went up because they were selling more and they had a more certain market. So they were more prepared to invest in seeds and fertilizers or whatever there might be. And, and then there is evidence also, which I summarized from other parts of the world, where an injection of cash, if, if, it's, if it's broadly based, leads to an increase in the supply. Whereas if you do what the banks did after the financial crisis, the opposite happens. They did quantitative easing where they gave to the banks a basic income. So all the bankers for leading us into this crisis were given by governments a basic income in response. Here's your basic income in quantitative easing. Thousands of millions of dollars was paid out in quantitative easing to the banks. What did they do? They inflated property prices. They invested in emerging markets, increased inequality. That's the disaster. And gradually growth has returned. At, at what cost? He's so good yeah. at boiling it down. Yeah, it's just a short couple minute explanation and it's just so it, it's so important for people to, to recognize that demand side of things like it's it there's just a question about inflation assumes that supply is static and so oh if if we give people more money then that just means that there's more money chasing the same amount of goods and then therefore prices go up there's like never this understanding that if there's more money then suppliers can actually increase supply in order to take advantage of that increased demand. And not only can that prevent prices from going up, but if supply goes up enough, then prices can go down. Like that is the reality of a complex adaptive system that is the economy. And it's just oversimplified to think that if you give people money, prices will go up. Yep. That's actually part of the, uh, like, so phase one of commingle is, you know, it's sort of like, let there be money. It's like, get money into the hands of people who don't normally have it, for example. And if you're, you, if you're doing a pilot in an area or if it's across the country or whatever, you now have this new market that's created. You know, if we get a million people on the platform um, and 700,000 of them are getting more money and there are people who didn't have as much money, this is now a demographic of people that can spend more. So you've, you've created a new opportunity for business. And the implications of that as we scale up and as we do pilots in different places are actually quite interesting if you think about what we could do with that. If we have people keeping money you know, in their accounts on the platform, um, can we couple it with incentive systems for local businesses to offer discounts to those people to then 
drive more local traffic. And there's, there's a, there's a million things you can do if you get the money flowing. And I think one of the, that's the reason one of my favorite metaphors for basic income is a circulatory system. It's like making sure enough nutrients gets to every cell in the body that it can, you know, participate to what degree it wants to. Yeah. So that's one of the things once we get up and running and launched and we've figured out how to be good at getting the right amount of money to the right people. Then the next question is like, okay, all this money is flowing. What other opportunities can we provide for people to use that money in their communities or in their lives or, or other ways for them to connect? Yeah. Just thinking about the circulatory system too, just like, I like that analogy as well. And it just makes me think of like how, I don't think our bodies would work very well if the way that it worked was that our heart pumped blood to our brain and then the brain blood like trickled down to the rest of the body. <laughs> right. And that, that is where anatomy uh, metaphors sort of fall apart is right. when you have people who are sort of assholes who want to be like, well, who's the butt and who's the foot right. and who's the head? It's like, you know, uh, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't mean to say that the rich are the brain, but I am like, it is It's interesting to think that when we think of like important parts, definitely the brain is important and it does not make sense. Um, like the brain is great, but uh, if you have gangrene, then that's going to kill off the whole body. So it doesn't matter right. if the, the brain is getting blood, it's still going to die that, with the rest of the body. That's where, it, the, yeah, that's where the metaphor really matters is like, whether you're the brain or the knee pit, um, if, if a piece, if a patch of skin somewhere isn't getting nutrition and it gets necrotic and infected and diseased, you're all going to die. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, then you, then you open up the, the option of, uh, amputating, which is not cool. It's not, I mean, I would <laughs> say using the brain, like, you're not going to amputate your society. I think most Let's people hope. wouldn't choose that naturally until we have. I guess, I mean, you go down to the future dystopian ends of the metaphor where it's like, at some point, our prosthetic replacement legs are going to be better than the the ones that are possible. And we'll all choose to be Blade Runners. Uh, and if you if you extend that metaphor into society, that's uh, pretty fucking terrifying. There's some Elysium stuff going on there. That's suddenly yeah. reminding, like, uh, that uh, was uh, our uh, episode uh, one or two, right? Where the guy was talking about how everything would be fine with automation because of genetically engineered, super intelligent humans. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, let's get that guy on. <laughs> Send him an invite. <laughs> right. He'd probably show up. All right. I got to go. Yep. Yep. We're at the end here. Um, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, we try to do this live on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, the edited version after the fact, uh, thanks for watching and please like and subscribe and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.